So uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, by Skype, uh, uh, even though it's two hours earlier in San Francisco. And I had a hard time finding a tie that went with my pajamas, so <laughs> that was my major uh, task for the morning. Um, and I'm sure that you've already heard everything and know everything there is to know now about Morgellons because uh, Marianne has given a talk. Um, but I'm going to talk about a different aspect of this disease that's been very intriguing, uh, namely canine filamentous dermatitis associated with Borrelia infection, which is basically Morgellons disease in dogs. Um, so first of all, I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial ties of any kind to anything. Um, so uh, Morgellons disease, as many of you know, uh, kind of resembles this famous photo by Richard Avedon of a beekeeper who used to have the bees like uh, crawling all over him. Uh, and that's often what Morgellons patients uh, feel like. Everything okay, Dave? Yeah, we can't see your, uh, go ahead and hit the plus sign to sh share your screen if you're ready to do your presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, see you, but not your presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's escape. And... Okay. So you want to share screen or? Yes, please. How's that? Hey, you're coming up. Okay, we've got it. We've got you. Now go ahead and uh, hide, uh, hide the Skype window, and you'll be all set to go. Go ahead and launch your presentation. There you go. Well, maybe I should. <laughs> I was wondering why nobody was laughing. <laughs> so again, uh, we're talking about canine filamentous dermatitis associated with Borrelia infection, basically uh, canine. Uh, uh, Lyme, uh, Morgellons in, uh, in dogs, um, and uh, this is uh, what many of you feel like uh, when you have this disease. Um, uh, Morgellons, as you've probably heard already, uh, is uh, a disease that was described in 2006 by Mary Leto, who was a laboratory technician who noticed that her son uh, had these weird fibers coming out of his skin. Uh, and she went to a, a bunch of doctors who said they didn't know what it was and couldn't figure it out. So she went uh, online and found this disease from the 17th century that uh, resembled what her son had. And that's how Morgellons started. Um, now, Morgellons disease, as you've probably heard, uh, involves uh, symptoms and signs, including skin lesions that can be on the head, the trunk, or the extremities, and the lesions progress to open wounds that heal abnormally or incompletely. Uh, there are prominent crawling sensations both within and on the skin surface. They're often conceptualized as bugs that are moving, stinging, or biting, but in fact there really aren't any bugs that have ever been found. And um, there are fibers, these fibers protruding from skin lesions, usually they're white, but they may be any bunch of, a, a range of colors, and they do fluoresce under ultraviolet light, which is a very interesting property. Uh, and they are identified as subdermal textile fibers on skin biopsy, uh, which they are really not, but they look like textile fibers on the biopsy. And they appear to be made primarily of keratin and collagen, although our understanding of these fibers is still evolving. Um, now, these uh, symptoms and signs are associated with additional symptoms, including fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, uh, neurological symptoms, and behavioral changes that are similar to the symptoms that are seen with Lyme disease. And this is with Lyme disease and other tick-borne uh, co-infections. Um, and in addition, other findings, there is a, a, a geographical distribution that was initially noted with this disease. Primarily, uh, patients were in Florida, Texas, and California. Uh, it's not entirely clear why that is, but it, basically the disease has been described now all over the world. Um, there's generally a history of exposure to dirt or, so or soil, uh, such as through gardening or camping. Uh, and that probably relates to the fact that the disease is related to Lyme disease and other tick-borne 
uh, illnesses, uh, which of course are acquired uh, from a tick bite, usually while gardening or camping or hiking or going out in the wild. So the link to Lyme disease between Morgellons disease and Lyme disease uh, was um, uh, solidified in a study that was done in 2010 uh, of 122 Morgellons patients. And of those 122 patients, 98% had positive tests for the Lyme spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, shown here on the right. Uh, and or a Lyme disease diagnosis. So this showed the significant association between uh, the skin disease, Morgellons disease, and, and Lyme disease. And um, if you turn this around, so 98% so of uh, Lyme patients, of Morgellons patients have Lyme disease, how many Lyme patients have uh, Morgellons disease? And this was presented last, uh, well, so this, this is a study from Australia um, by Peter Main, who's now happily retired, uh, showing that in the 500 uh, Lyme patients that he found in Australia, which was truly amazing because Australia, as you know, has absolutely no Lyme disease. But in spite of that, uh, he was able to find 500 patients with Lyme disease. And of those 500 patients, 6% had Morgellons. So it was a small percentage, 6%, um, that uh, in Australia, um, but that was Australia, and we know that everything there is upside down. So what about in the USA? Uh, this was a study that was presented last year at this conference by uh, Melissa <coughs> Fessler, who's, who was McElroy at that time. Um, and she looked at 1,000 active Lyme disease patients uh, in our practice in San Francisco and found 60 patients with confirmed Morgellons disease. So again, 6% of patients had, had Morgellons. So a small number, um, and it's not clear what's different about the 6% of Lyme patients that get Morgellons versus the other 94% of Lyme patients who do not. And that's one of the issues that remains to be determined with, with this skin disease. So many of you are familiar with the lesions that we see with Morgellons. These are these kind of ragged, uh, uh, lesions that can be found on any part of the body. Uh, they're sores that basically don't heal, and um, they can be seen in, on the legs, uh, as shown here, and also it can be quite disfiguring on the face uh, and um, basically anywhere on the body uh, the, can, can have these lesions that arise. Um, the lesions do have these fibers that can be multicolored, um, they can be either in the sores or under the skin. Um, and uh, here's another a pic nice picture. Um, and the fibers can fluoresce. Uh, this is what we call the anemone pattern of Morgellons. Uh, these are very, uh, these would be beautiful if they weren't in your skin. And uh, they do fluoresce under UV light. So that is a characteristic of Morgellons fibers. Um, on electron microscopy, the fibers are really pretty bland looking. They look like sort of deformed hairs, basically, but they're different from hairs uh, because uh, their structure looks somewhat, somewhat different. Um, and sometimes they have this kind of metallic coating, which is quite interesting, and you could imagine that this would be quite painful to have these metal-coated fibers coming out of your skin. Uh, again, this is an electron micrograph. Um, so um, all of that is, is very interesting, and this was the human disease, but what we also found a number of years ago was that there is a disease of cattle that looks very much like Morgellons disease, and this disease is called bovine digital dermatitis, or BDD. Uh, BDD is a disease that, uh, um, that, that cattle get on their hoofs, and it causes significant pain uh, with walking and discomfort for the animals. And if you want to see what this looks like here, you can see this lesion on the hoof of this cow. Uh, it's very open and uh, looks like an open sore, very much like Morgellons lesions in humans. Um, when we looked at these lesions, we found that they had fibers, very much like uh, human lesions, except that they were much larger. Obviously, cows are much larger than humans. And they also fluoresced under UV light. 
So again, these looked very much like the lesions that we saw uh, with the human disease. And um, when we looked further um, and analyzed these fibers, it looked like they were made up generally of keratin, which is the same thing that's in your fingernails. It's what your fingernails are made of. Uh, but again, much, much larger than the human lesions. And also, interestingly, these lesions had spirochetes that were visible uh, on sections of the lesions. And turns out that these spirochetes are not Borrelia. They are mostly treponemal spirochetes, which are the same family that, has, that, that causes syphilis. Um, but again, there was some involvement of spirochetes in these bovine lesions. Um, and um, again, suggests an etiology that's related to infection uh, with these bacteria. So here we have an animal model of Morgellons disease. And the question is, if there's one animal model, could there be another one? And so um, here's my cute dog picture, uh, which I'm sure everybody loves. Um, here's the not so cute dog picture. And this is a dog with a bunch of ticks feeding on its ear. Uh, and dogs, as you know, are susceptible to Lyme disease. Um, because they do get lots of tick exposure and tick bites. And interestingly, if you look at the map of canine uh, Lyme disease in the US, uh, there are a couple of things that are quite interesting. First of all, it's not just in the Northeast or the upper Midwest, it's everywhere. It's pretty much all over the place. And I should point out that the white states don't mean there's no Lyme disease, it just means there's less than 100 cases reported. Um, but it's there, so it's really everywhere. Some of the heaviest states are that, that have um, Lyme disease in dogs are Florida, Texas, and California. So again, it sort of uh, parallels the, the distribution of Morgellons disease in, in humans. Um, and so as dog owners know, um, Lyme disease can be a big problem with their animals. So we set out to look at you know, whether this um, Lyme disease that's all over the place could be associated with skin lesions in dogs. And uh, we, uh, and, and Marianne Middleveen uh, had a link to a veterinary clinic in, um, in Calgary uh, run by two veterinarians, George Rotaru and, and Jody McMurray, uh, who started noticing when they heard about Morgellons disease that some of their dogs had skin lesions that were uncharacterized. And this got us interested in looking at Morgellons disease in, in dogs, in the dogs from this clinic. Um, so um, we uh, actually found nine dogs that had skin lesions consistent with uh, the Morgellons. Uh, and they're shown here on the top of this slide, um, C1 to C9. Uh, the breed of these dogs um, was varied. Uh, Three or four dogs were bulldog breeds. Uh, three were English bulldogs. One was a bully, which I, I understand is a crossbreed of bulldog. And then there were two schnauzers and then uh, a, a golden retriever and a beagle pug and a chihuahua. So different breeds uh, that had these lesions. Uh, the age of these dogs is shown here. Um, and then the sex uh, shown here, there was a female predominance with um, uh, five, uh, uh, six females and three males. All of the dogs had been, well, well, eight of the nine dogs had been spayed or neutered. And then interestingly, when we did serology on, on the dogs, the three dogs that had Lyme serology done were all negative by the standard Lyme serology. So this says something about how good serology is for dogs in terms of diagnosing Lyme disease. And um, most of the dogs were uh, resided in Alberta, Canada, uh, but some of them were also from the US. Um, and then as controls, we had four other dogs that are shown here, CC1 to four. Um, we got samples of their hair or skin uh, and we did testing for Lyme disease using uh, molecular techniques, uh, polymerase chain reaction, uh, in three different laboratories. Um, one was at Mount Allison University in uh, Nova Scotia, one was at the University of New Haven, and one at Australian Biologics in Sydney. 
Uh, and all of these dogs, the, the control dogs, tested negative for Lyme disease by this very sensitive PCR technique uh, in, these lab, in three different labs. So we knew that we had dogs that did not have Lyme disease as the controls. Um, the interesting, we, we also asked the pet owners uh, whether they knew anything about Morgellons disease. And interestingly, three of the pet owners did uh, have lesions that were consistent with Morgellons. Uh, the other six did not. And those three owners obviously were aware of Morgellons disease and kind of understood what it was and what the skin lesions could be. Um, so it was quite interesting to find the same thing in their dogs. Um, the lesions in dogs do look a little bit different because dogs, of course, have fur and the lesions are sometimes partly hidden. As you can see here, there are these sort of little pink spots here that were very itchy and uncomfortable. And, and often we noted that the dogs had a change in personality when they had these lesions. They would go from being friendly to being more aggressive and, and unfriendly. Uh, and probably because they were very uncomfortable with these lesions. And to show you what this looks like in, in a dog that's been shaved, uh, this is actually another dog not from the study, uh, you see these kind of nasty, uh, ragged lesions uh, that look a bit like ringworm, but these lesions did have fibers in them, so they, look, they were Morgellons lesions. Um, and this is what they look like under the fur. So, um, and then looking at these lesions under the uh, handheld microscope, again, it's a little bit different from humans because there is fur, but you can see that there are these different colors like blue and red that are coming out of these fibers. And so there's a mix of these fibers with the fur. And this is very much like the same, the same kind of fibers that you would see in human lesions. Um, other dogs, however, had more um, scary looking fibers. This is a kind of a, a coarse black filament that was seen in one of the dogs that was, looked like um, hairs that had been um, uh, matted together. Uh, they were very coarse and looked like they're very uh, painful um, uh, coming out of the skin. Um, this is, again, another form of, of Morgellons fiber. Um, so just to show you this in a table, these were the nine dogs, and this is what their lesions looked like under uh, 50x magnification, 100x, and then when the lesions were, when, when the fibers were sectioned. And again, under 50x magnification, you had different colored fibers, white, pink, bluish purple, and teal. Um, they fluoresce under UV light, um, just like human lesions and the bovine lesions. Um, under 100x, um, the fibers were 10 to 40 microns in diameter, so not very big. Uh, and they were embedded, sometimes thickened, as the one I showed you, the black fibers that I showed you, uh, which looked like hairs that might have been uh, matted together. And then um, uh, with the uh, section fibers, um, uh, they stained positive for keratin and collagen, very much like human Morgellons fibers. Um, and again, to show you this uh, in pictures, this is a, uh, a Morgellons fiber from one of the dogs that stained blue-green, uh, which had collagen in it, uh, which stains like that on special stains. And then uh, this fiber on the right, um, was a uh, was a stain with a Borrelia stain, and you can see that the red Borrelia stain uh, stained several organisms that were attached to this fiber. So again, suggesting that there's a Lyme type organism that's associated with these lesions and with these fibers. Um, and if we, when we did other special stains um, in these lesions, uh, we could find uh, again spirochetes. Um, using a Dieter Lee silver stain, which stains spirochetes, that's shown on the left. And then also with a more specific Borrelia immunostain, we could find uh, Borrelia uh, organisms in these lesions. So suggesting again that there was an association with, with the Lyme spirochete. 
Uh, and when we cultured the lesions and uh, looked at them under fluorescent light, you could see these spirochetes in the, in the cultures. Uh, so again, suggesting that this was a uh, lesion that was associated with um, Borrelia uh, Lyme spirochetes. Um, and by the way, all of this work, of course, was, or most of this work was done by Marianne Middleveen, and um, I should give her credit for most of it, as usual. Um, and then when we did molecular testing of the spirochetes that we found in these, uh, in these lesions, again, the molecular testing showed very clearly that these were Lyme spirochetes, Borrelia, uh, Burdorferi. Uh, this particular sample had 99% identity with Borrelia burgdorferi. So again, proving that these lesions were associated with Lyme disease. So here we have a disease that uh, looks like Lyme disease in dogs that's associated with the Lyme spirochete that causes lesions and fibers that are very much like the human disease and also like the, the bovine disease too. So another animal model for Lyme disease what happened to these dogs? Uh, well, they were, most of them were treated with antibiotics and they actually did quite well with antibiotic treatment. This was the, the, the first bulldog who had been uh, very sweet before he got uh, the disease and then became more aggressive and unfriendly. And he was treated with antibiotics and went back to being his sweet self and his lesions on his back disappeared. So very, very good outcome in this dog. Uh, the dogs seemed to do quite well with antibiotic therapy, but not all of them got treated uh, for various reasons. Sometimes the owners didn't really believe that this is what was going on. Um, but usually with, with antibiotic treatment, uh, the dogs did quite well. So um, in conclusion, uh, filamentous dermatitis analogous to Morgellons disease may be a manifestation of Lyme disease in domestic dogs. And interestingly, the genetic factors that contribute to Morgellons disease in humans may be amenable to study in different dog breeds. Um, it, for example, um, it, it seems like there may be a predilection for this in, in bulldogs, which generally have a lot of skin problems anyway because they're so inbred. And uh, we are working with a group at Cornell uh, that's interested in looking at dog genetics and would be very interested to look at dogs that have this type of skin disease to see if there's a genetic predisposition for getting, for getting Lyme disease, basically, uh, and, and more Morgellons disease in these dogs when they have Lyme disease. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge my coworkers, um, uh, Jenny Burke from Australian Biologics and Ava Shapi from New Haven, uh, and also um, Steve McLean and Joel Israel from McLean Labs. Of course, Marianne Middleveen did, did most of the work for this, and she's uh, to be congratulated once again. Um, the veterinarians involved, George Rotaru and Jody McMurray, were incredibly helpful in getting the clinical specimens for this study. Um, and then uh, Melissa Fessler, who uh, helped quite a bit with the study, uh, and the others on this slide. Uh, Vet Lloyd, I should mention, from Mount Allison University, who also did some of the PCR testing on these dogs. And uh, as usual, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Charles Holman. Thank you very much.